Hi, this video is sponsored by the wonderful Divoom. Learn more during the commercial break. Hey everyone, welcome to another big Magical Girl video. A while back I promised to make a video about Chinese Magical Girls as there's a lot of series that still remain mostly unknown. However, while planning this project, I realized there's a lot to talk about with debatably the most popular Chinese Magical Girl series, Balala -la -la the Fairies. With three movies and eight different series, with some having more than one season, I knew Balala -la needed its own video. That doesn't mean I won't cover more Chinese series in the future though. Flower Fairy, your day is coming. But before I begin, there are three things I need to discuss. One, I do not want to see any xenophobic comments. You can hate a country's actions without being disrespectful to the people. If you find a hateful comment, kindly report it. Usually my comment filters catch that ugly behavior, but not always. I want my channel to continue being a safe space. Two, I will be using the characters' official English names. I'm not whitewashing these characters, these are the official names given by the company that created the franchise in the hopes of licensing it internationally. That has yet to happen, but I'm using the names. Number three, as I was going through the different pieces of Balala Media, I realized that not all of them are fully translated. That being said, the show is pretty easy to follow and I'll do my best to be as thorough as possible in each review segment. My main goal with this video is to create interest in the series and help you see that it isn't just a Precure ripoff. Now let's discover Balala the Fairies! Balala the Fairies, or Balala Little Magic Fairy, was created and produced by the Chinese multinational conglomerate Alpha Group Co. The company primarily focuses on toys, animation, mass media assets, and entertainment in general. The majority of the company's work is family friendly, but they've also licensed more mature content from other countries to the Chinese people. At least, that's what Wikipedia says. Anyway, Alpha Group Co. was formed in 1993 by Kai Dongqing. They primarily focused on animation and toys. Although they have original properties, one of which is a collaboration with Hasbro, the company also made toys for popular series like SpongeBob SquarePants. However, it wouldn't be until 2008 that kids would get to see the first season of Balala the Fairies. Well, it's technically not the first season. The timeline for Balala is a little weird. The animated series are main canon, while the live action series are either prequels or don't count at all for some reason. Regardless, they're all worth talking about, but this timeline is weird. <laughs> this entire season is in 480p! I wish I was joking! YouTube had 720p by the end of 2008. This is gross! But I'll try not to hold it against the show. Balala the Fairy stars a yellow fairy named Shirley. She's the guardian of the fairy stone, but because she's not responsible, the fairy queen traps her in a music box. This music box ends up in China, and two little girls named Maggie and Michelle set Shirley free. She pretends to be their babysitter and teaches the girls about magic. The episodes consist of the three learning from one another as Shirley doesn't quite understand the human world, and the Lin sisters are the first humans in a long time to use magic. I'm assuming this because in episode 3 the queen drops in and is like, well, we don't usually let humans have magic powers, but you two have good hearts, so I'll let it slide. If you pass a magic exam! Except she doesn't say what or when the exam is. And the episode plays out normally with Maggie being irresponsible and then the girls fixing her mistake and helping an old lady reunite with her dead daughter's ugly CG cat. They use a real cat for most of the shots, could they not get the cat to walk over? And I think the cat was dead to begin with because that's not the real cat. That's the dog that was turned into the cat. I think. Anyway, after that the queen's hologram comes back and she's like, Hmm, you two really should not have used magic. But you helped an old lady not be depressed, so have, have some, some party, party city wigs and musical, musical toys. toys. If you can't tell, I love this show already. The girls are also given a magic spell book containing a fairy named Fifi, who is annoying, but her model looks decent. Honestly, the magical CG parts of the show look pretty good for 2008. Most episodes of Balala consist of the girls going about their day, 
coming across a problem, asking Shirley for advice, attempting to use magic in a way that causes hijinks, realizing that they need to use magic for good, and recording their lesson in the magic book so the queen can see if they're still worthy of using magic. All the while, Shirley learns more about the human world. The plot starts to kick in again at the end of episode 5 when Shirley gets magical visions of these bugs. Continuing into episode 6, Shirley realizes the sisters forgot their lunches and rushes to the park to give them to the girls. After that sweet interaction, Shirley decides to enjoy a nice walk. Until her headache returns. With some movie maker effects, we're officially reintroduced to the main villain of the series, Luna. Remember when I said that Shirley was put into a music box because she was irresponsible? Well, the reason that happened is because her former best friend Luna absorbed all the black magic and stole the fairy stone Shirley was supposed to protect. And to add an extra layer of drama, the reason Luna became evil in the first place was because of Shirley's position as the guardian of the fairy stone. Luna's jealousy is the reason Shirley was trapped in a box for who knows how long. When the two reunite, they immediately start fighting. I can't be mad at Shirley for this because I would be mad too. Imagine someone who used to be your best friend stabbing you in the back, embarrassing you in front of someone you greatly admire, and being the reason you were locked in a box for an uncertain amount of time. Throw Luna six feet under, Shirley! I'm rooting for you! Also, the bees. The bees! The bees are in the garden! Yeah, this fight kind of sucks. <clears throat> but I appreciate the drama. Even one of the mean schoolgirls witnesses the fight and becomes Luna's apprentice, giving the girls another threat to deal with. Lily hates Maggie and Michelle, Luna hates Shirley, and wants to take over both the human and fairy worlds. It's a lot to take in. Also, the way magic is seen in this series is a bit confusing. Maggie and Michelle use their magic out in the open multiple times, and are only caught by Lily thus far, who in episode 8 straight up has her magical item in hand while her friends are right next to her? Would they not at least ask where she got it? Possibly thinking it's a cool accessory? Anyway, the series slowly progresses as the girls try to earn points to upgrade their magic by doing good deeds with the spells they've learned so far. All while Lily continues to be an angsty jerk. Oh, and of course we need a prince. This is Noah. He's the queen's son and will continue to be a prominent character in this franchise. He and Shirley have a loving rivalry that I think is adorable. The show has really good pacing in my opinion. Characters like Lily are given time to grow and change before the season ends, which I really love. She goes from a bratty kid, to a villain, to a redeemed helper of the queen. And that journey is wonderful to watch. I think her story alone makes Balawa the Fairies worth watching, but I also enjoyed the dynamic of the main trio. By the end, they feel like sisters. And Luna? Wonderfully evil. I can't really take her seriously because of the show's age and Party City wigs, but the story is a lot of fun. That being said, I can understand why this live-action season is seen as kind of a test season or a prequel. If you like shows like Miracle Tunes, Pretty Guardian Sailor Moon, or other tokusatsu type shows, you're gonna like Balala the Fairies. I know I did. Okay, now we're at the official first season, Balala the Fairies, Rainbow Heartstone. Originally airing from March 26, 2011 to November 21st of the same year, Rainbow Heartstone is a direct follow-up to the previous season, despite being animated. However, you don't need to watch the 2008 live action to watch Rainbow Heartstone, as the show does a good job with filling viewers in on previously established lore. The show begins with Maggie and Michelle returning to the fairy castle. They reunite with Shirley, there's a magic tree and rock. Sometimes I wonder if I'm sober when I write these scripts. Anyway, they're not the most important characters anymore. Our true lead is Sarah, who is also referred to as Sandy, so that's what I'll call her. A little apprentice fairy who is considered gifted in both magic and intelligence. She causes trouble for the teacher Cindy, and later Shirley, as she flees to the human world to find her missing mother. The next few episodes are about Sandy joining the human school as a gifted kid. Can't wait to see her burnout in 10 years! The rainbow magic being stolen. And the new villain, Shaman Dragon, and his three spirits, Fire, Earth, and Water, who are trying to stop the fairies from restoring their kingdom and magic. However, it takes a little bit for the girls to become aware of the declining power of the fairy kingdom. In episode 7, the girls return to the fairy kingdom. With Sandy. I guess she decided to stop being a little shit. Anyway, all of them volunteer to defend the castle together, and the queen gives them some exposition. This is the rainbow flower, which is the embodiment of the first queen. 
who sacrificed herself for her kingdom in order to protect it forever. Unfortunately, the power has been stolen by the Shaman Dragon, and the current queen is using her power to keep the flower from dying. But her magic isn't strong enough to keep the flower alive forever. If the flower dies, all magic will fade away and the kingdom will disappear. So the girlies and Prince Noah, oh my gosh, hi! Decide to aid the queen. Sandy finds a magic book that helps her find more information about the first queen, which leads her to search for flower spirits. And it turns out they're actually really aggressive. Oh my, oh my gosh, gosh, she's, she's just, just a, a kid. kid. But soon they fess up some lore. It turns out when flowers die in this world, they turn into the crystals that surround the rainbow flower. Neat. But more importantly, when the first queen became the rainbow flower, thousands of flower spirits followed and used their own energy for her sake. I do find it disturbing that it's the flower's goal in life to die, die and be by, by the side, side of their queen. But regardless, the girls go back to the queen with their new insight, and they're on a search for the notebook left by the flower spirits. Which falls out of the sky! Okay, very convenient. But not convenient enough because bad guys! The bad guys steal the notebook, but Maggie, Michelle, Shirley, Noah, and the queen all use their powers to try and get it back. The queen is so polite about the whole thing too. I could never. Anyway, the bad guys retreat, the queen faints, and that's how episode 7 ends. So far, while I have so much love for cheesy live action shows, the pacing of Rainbow Heartstone is so much better, and I hope it stays that way. Each episode flows with the next, and that's so satisfying. Rainbow Heartstone truly feels like an ongoing story that you're seeing every part of. As the story continues, we find out that the notebook can only be used by Sandy. Because she has a pure heart? Hmm, child or not? She's definitely got some meanness in her, so big doubt, but whatever. Unfortunately, when she tries to read the book, she falls into a deep sleep. Without Sandy's help, the group can't save the fairy kingdom. Maggie and Michelle try to use the book as well, but they too fall into a coma. Shirley panics, the Queen and Noah come in, and he has the audacity to lecture her! Shirley is trying her best, okay? Don't be mean to her. Meanwhile, our three girls in a coma are in a connected magical dream by the author of the notebook. Her name is Cece, and she's adorable. She explains everything about the rainbow flower, the importance of the rainbow crystals, and how both are important to keeping the rainbow kingdom safe. And with that, the girls are released from their comas. Shirley, undeservingly in my opinion, is ready to give up her role as Maggie, Michelle, and Sandy's caretaker, but the rainbow box, meant for collecting positive powers for the flower, chooses Shirley as its guardian, just like the notebook chose Sandy. But no happy ending yet because bird! Oh my gosh, was that blood? Now it's up to Shirley, Noah, Maggie, Michelle, and Sandy to collect the positive emotions needed to power the crystals, save the rainbow flower, and save their beloved kingdom. The rest of the series is fun, episodic adventures of the girls learning good morals, collecting positive power, stopping bad guys, and eventually, saving the kingdom. All while keeping their magic identities a secret. Oh, and Sandy does find her mom. Who is she? I won't spoil that for you here. Rainbow Heartstone is an average magical girl show. The animation is dated, but it's consistent. The way the stories are structured is consistent too, which might be boring to some, but I binged this and I wasn't bored once. There are some eye-roll worthy moments, like the live action season. I don't appreciate fat shaming a child, it's not funny and it feels too mean. But there are just as many moments that made me smile or helped me connect with the characters. If you can look past its cheaper look, I'd recommend giving Rainbow Heartstone a watch. <laughs> I need to rant. 
Not because the movies still don't have English subtitles, they're pretty easy to follow, but because the official Balala YouTube channel had the movies labeled wrong. I was watching movie two like it was movie one because that's what the title said, and the thumbnail is the first movie poster, but what was happening on screen wasn't matching any synopsis I found, so I spent like 20 minutes being confused until I checked movie two, which is the first in the playlist, and yeah, two is actually one. Balala, please fix that, thank you. Balala took a hiatus after Rainbow Heartstone ended on November 21st, 2011. It wouldn't be until January 31st, 2013 that we'd see the next installment in the franchise, the first movie simply titled Balala the Fairies, the movie. It too stars the trio of Shirley, Maggie, and Michelle, but two out of the three have different actresses from the 2008 series. That's actually something I haven't talked about. Balala has constant recasts of the main characters. It's not distracting to me in the animated series as much as it is in the live action series. Both Maggie and Michelle have had multiple replacements up to this point. But you know who returned for this movie despite not being in Rainbow Heartstone? Shirley's actress! I love her and I think she is so great in this role. No shade to any of the other actors here. They range from okay to good. But Shirley is fun. I might be a Shirley stan. Back to the movie itself, the film opens with a slightly higher pitched version of the theme song as pretty art of the characters flow through alongside the credits. If I saw this in a theater, I'd be pretty hyped. After that lovely opening, we cut to Shirley and Noah in a beautiful garden. Oh, oh my, my gosh, gosh, can this series keep, keep the, the film, film budget? budget? This, this set, set is, is so pretty. pretty! Anyway, they're playing a game, but the rainbow birds scare Shirley and Ooh. she falls. Not accepting defeat, Shirley uses magic to win their game, which upsets Noah because they agreed, no magic. Still loving their love-hate vibes. Meanwhile, Maggie and Michelle are outside with their friends. They find an injured purple bird and a sparkly rock from a meteor shower. They take both of these before returning home to their mother's questionable cooking. Back to Shirley and Noah, the fairy queen summons the two and explains that she was good friends with the King of Halle. After his passing, the Queen of Halle took over as ruler. However, something has happened and she must send Noah and Shirley on a mission to aid them. Even giving Shirley a magic mirror, which I totally, totally don't, don't want to buy. buy. Not me. me. Back to the sisters, they cast a spell to protect the purple bird from their parents, and talk about how they wish Shirley was there to help them with their current situation. As the two sleep, the bird seems to take energy from the rock. That's not concerning at all. Anyway, the villains Cyrus Wolf and Cyrus Snake are here too. And the one that looks like Kunzite spots Maggie's glowing purple backpack. He wants whatever power is in her bag, but needs to figure out how to get down. Goofy. What's weird about this purple power is that it gives Maggie these creepy green eyes and allows her to hurt someone she's angry with. When she and her sister argue about something mundane, she unknowingly wills a parked car to hit her. Luckily, she's able to stop this from happening, but that's so scary. When the girls get to school, Maggie reluctantly shows off the gem in class after Tim does this. Boom. As the bell rings, Maggie realizes she forgot to do her homework. She leaves class with a notebook, Michelle follows, suspecting her sister is misusing magic. The girls get into another argument, and as Maggie glares at Michelle again, her eyes glow green and all the windows in the hallway shatter. As the story continues, Maggie's temper gets worse, but things escalate as she's being followed. Finally, the core four characters reunite and transform to fight. I'm loving these movie quality transformations. We don't get a super long fight though, and Shirley returns home with Maggie and Michelle, while Noah goes to do some further investigation on the bad guys. So a part of this movie that really annoyed me was the constant jokes about the mom's horrible cooking. It fits with the canon, this isn't a random new addition for jokes, but it gets a little too over the top for me. Luckily, Shirley takes over cooking for Maggie and Michelle's household, so all is well, or so we think. The villains from earlier control the bodies of two of the executives the girl's dad works with. As they enter the home, the two spot a picture of Maggie and ask to meet her. The girls are uncomfortable with the men's odd behavior as the pair scour the room in search for a key. Dinner is served, and the family are shocked by the pair's messy eating habits. Cyrus Wolf almost reveals their true identity after getting a little drunk, but was stopped by Cyrus Snake. Finally, the drunk executives leave and Cyrus Wolf and Cyrus Snake leave their bodies leaving the executives confused about the past few hours. Once those two leave, Shirley finally gets to sit down with the girls and explain why she's back on Earth. The Fairy Queen had told Shirley and Noah that Halle was supposed to have been destroyed 1,000 years ago, 
However, the King of Halle had borrowed the planetary key from the fairy castle and solved that disaster. Since then, the planetary key remained in Halle, with its strong power keeping them in proper orbit. The planetary key was guarded by Aisha. However, Aisha wanted to use the power of the planetary key to seize the throne of Halle. During the Queen's confrontation, Aisha managed to flee Halle with the planetary key. Without the planetary key, Halle has started to drift off course, and the Fairy Queen believes that Aisha managed to flee to Earth. Now it's up to Noah and Shirley to find Aisha and the planetary key. Kingdom, bad person, planetary key, doomsday? Okay. Outside, the purple bird transforms into a human. She sneaks into Maggie and Michelle's room and reaches for Maggie's purple gem. Shirley stops her and informs the girls of what happened the following morning. Despite, Despite the, the obvious, obvious danger, danger, Maggie protects her precious treasure. Meanwhile, the Fairy Queen realizes that the wayward planet Halle is heading in the direction of the Fairy Castle, and they need to find the planetary key to stop it. Back to Maggie, she is losing pretty badly at her badminton competition, so she storms off and starts using magic to manipulate the game. Michelle confronts her for her use of magic, and demands a reason for her recent change in character. A frustrated Maggie exclaims that she doesn't know why she changed, and cries. The acting here is... not great. Maybe it's just me, but I started laughing. It's really forced, but they are kids, so I'll let it slide. As she cries, Maggie is confronted by Cyrus Wolf and Cyrus Snake. The two take Maggie to where she found the gem, and demand that she give it to them. Luckily, Maggie is kinda street smart, and she tricks them with a regular stone as she runs off into the woods. After realizing what she's done, the duo chase after her and Maggie falls, dropping the gem. Cyrus Snake and Cyrus Wolf reach for it, but are stopped by a woman in purple. She collects the stone and helps Maggie up. She introduces herself as Aisha, and explains that the purple bird was her disguised form. She thanks Maggie for saving her, but is soon knocked out by the other woman in purple. Michelle, Shirley, and Noah find Maggie. She explains that Aisha saved her, and that she's not a bad person. With some convincing from Shirley, Aisha explains her side of the story. The Queen of Halle had ambitions to rule a larger kingdom than the tiny one she had, and intended to force the Fairy Queen to renounce her throne with the might of the planetary key behind her, not caring that Halle would move out of orbit by seizing it. Aisha continues to explain that the key also has the power to affect the human mind and enhance powers to an indefinite scale. Learning this, Shirley realizes that the Fairy Queen is in great danger. The group goes back to the Fairy Kingdom and we get a huge fight with everyone. For the time and budget, I'm really impressed with the quality. Some parts have aged better than others, but it's overall a wonderful production. Of course, the planetary key is returned to its proper place, the bad guys are stopped, the fairy kingdom is saved, and life becomes normal again. Mom's, Mom's bad, bad cooking included. included. My face is back! You know what that means. A gift idea for you! The holidays are upon us and I have the perfect gift for a person in any fandom. I present to you the Divoom Pixu 64. Just download the Divoom app, connect the Pixu 64 to your Wi-Fi, and you'll be able to display your own custom artwork or one of the many options already available on the app. I'm a huge fan of Divoom's products and I love how they can make any setup cooler. They're easy to use and display. Just download the app and get creative! Use my link in the description to get your own Pixu64, and thank you to Divum for sponsoring this video! Season 2, which is actually Season 3, but we've discussed that already, is called Balala the Fairies Miracle Dance. It takes place in the same canon as the previous two seasons, so Shirley, Maggie, Michelle, Noah, and the Queen are back. Sandy, however, is no longer in the main cast and is replaced by Emma. She's one of the princesses of the Kingdom of Gemini. Evidently in the Balala universe, each zodiac sign has a kingdom. 
Very cool, and predates Star Twinkle Precure by a few years. So, Valala did something before a more popular Magical Girl franchise? Crazy. So while the now older looking Maggie and Michelle are having a little dance adventure at school, Emma bumps into them as she's being chased by mysterious figures. That's when we see the animal mascots of this season. They look... alright, I guess. But I need you to watch this scene. The way it's cut, I thought they just abandoned her in the middle of the road. <laughs> Hilarious. So Emma is now a student at the girls' school. They all join Miss Kelly's dance troupe because this season is dance-themed, even though singing is just as important here. Shirley has returned to Earth, and the gang is searching for the Gemini princesses. And it's obvious who one of them is. Luckily, our leads are pretty smart and end the search quickly. Emma joins the main team, and the group is on a mission to stop the Dark Fairy slash Queen Halle, Cyrus Wolf, and Cyrus Snake, as well as find the Night Starbox, which keeps the constellation safe. If the fairies don't succeed, Earth will be in great danger, as usual. But on top of all that, Emma also needs to find her twin sister, so that spices things up a bit. The whole show revolves around collecting these constellation boxes and attempting to save both Emma's world and Earth. The problem with binging shows like this for videos is that they can be quite repetitive. Sometimes this bothers me, but Miracle Dance has enough differences to make it stand out. New items, characters, and conflicts all make the show unique. Even if there are less interesting parts like the dance school, the singing despite having a small selection of music, that dance sequence that is reused too many times, and some jokes that don't land for me personally. Can we please stop fat shaming a literal child? Despite its flaws, there's still a lot to appreciate here. Like the animation. It is gradually getting better. Even though the 3D and 2D models don't perfectly blend together. Look, Look at, at these, these fish, fish in episode, episode 5. five. <laughs> I can see great improvement with how everything moves in general. I especially love the magical transformations. They are adorable, and I hope the series continues to improve. I also appreciate the continued focus on learning good morals alongside the magical fun. I think having that balance makes these more lighthearted series stand out in a positive way, even if other aspects of the show aren't perfect. Despite the visual improvements and addition of Emma, I think Rainbow Heartstone was the more engaging season to watch. Miracle Dance is fine, it has good moments, but it also left me bored at times. The ending does lead us into two separate stories, though. But before we get into those seasons, we have to talk about the second movie. We are now in the year 2014. A few months after Miracle Dance aired its final episode, cinemas were blessed with the second film in the Balala Cinematic Trilogy. Balala the Fairies, The Magic Trial. The movie opens with an adorable chibi animated sequence. We then cut to Maggie and Michelle in a spooky cave. They kick a snake around for a bit, jump into a rock man's mouth, do a squid game challenge with no monetary compensation, and as they fall, that annoying fairy yells at the audience to help the girls. But that doesn't do much, and they land in an office. As they're getting scolded for failing what seems to be a magic fairy test, Shirley pops in and defends them. Once, Once again, again, I would, I would die, die for, for Shirley. Shirley. The Queen and Noah fly in. I'm sensing obvious tension between him and Shirley. I don't know what she's saying, but it's important enough for our favorite trio to attempt to clean up this super cool library. Amongst the mess, Shirley picks up a pink book that pops out a ring. She puts it on. This Maya the Bee reject is angry about it, and they laugh at him. <laughs> Hilarious. Then we meet a bad guy in a cage, and he tricks Shirley into freeing him. This is Fadoba, and he has entered the human world to destroy everything. I guess. Honestly, this first fight before he leaves for Earth is pretty cool. Like the first movie, some things have aged better than others, but overall everything looks like a way better version of the first live action series. As the trio is sent to Earth, we get the cutest musical number. It does feel out of place considering we're 30 minutes into the movie, but I can vibe with this. Back to the villain, you know this guy is bad because he licks display cakes. 
Luckily our girls and this guy who has a crush on Shirley, Noah gets jealous later, it's amazing, are there to help. And they humble an angry man? This, this guy, guy will, will come, come back, back later. later. At the dance studio, which is the other key Earth location, Fadoba possesses a little girl named Meow Meow. It sounds like I'm saying Meow 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 Meow, but I'm not. Who is the daughter of the cake customer that got humbled. She's already a jerk beforehand, but with Fadoba's help, she's straight up evil. Now it's up to our favorite fairies to stop the scary man and save the bratty girl. I enjoyed this movie, it's very cute, but it doesn't feel as grand as the first one. The next two seasons are interesting because one is another live action, meaning it isn't canon to Balala, but it does star the same characters as the previous season, and the other has the exact same music branding, but it's animated, so, so it's canon. canon. But both aired in 2015, so that had to be confusing for kids, right? First, I'll discuss the mystery note. It's the hardest season to find, and I was only able to find 28 out of the 52 episodes in the worst quality and without subtitles. So let me do my best to summarize what the season is about. This season is completely music themed. These girlies feel the need to sing. So for Shirley's birthday, she is gifted a musical treasure box, which contains a mysterious musical gem. However, Queen Halle is back on her evil streak and sends her son to steal the gem with the intent of gaining power and getting back at the queen. Of course, the fairies stick together and fight this evil throughout the season. Basic plot, I like the introduction of a Dark Prince character. I think that would present an interesting dynamic with Noah. I need, I need this, this love, love triangle, triangle drama. drama. That is such a neat dynamic for the series, if that's the case. I also like the weapons, and even the costumes, which look better than the 2008 series. At least they do in 240p. Again, I wish I could find the show in better quality. It seems like a fun time. Now to discuss Finding Melody. From this point on, none of the series have complete English translations. For example, only one episode of Finding Melody has a fan translation. Which is a shame because the animation is a million times better than anything else in this franchise. Oh my goodness, this is such an upgrade! Look at this intro! Episode 1 begins with two princesses happily going to a music festival. But oh no! The two are separated! It turns out that one of those girls is the current queen, who isn't doing too well. She goes to the garden and meets a fairy playing a harp. The little dude has incredible magic, but we can't enjoy that for long because the queen faints once more. Meanwhile on Earth, Maggie and Michelle's mom is working at a bakery. Wait, wasn't it a big joke that she can't cook? Glad she improved. Oh, and that guy from the second movie is still here, being goofy and liking Shirley. Great. Anyway, Maggie and Michelle head to school, and their teacher tells the class that they have a new student. Well, kind of. He evidently went to their school at some point, but transferred out, and now he's back. He's immediately popular with the girls because of his music skills, but I can say from experience, having a guy play guitar at you is a huge red flag. There's, There's a, a reason, reason all, all the, the Kens, Kens did, it. did it. As the kids bully Tim, Emma makes her grand return. The dance troupe is on hiatus since their teacher is overseas, but everyone is happy to see her regardless. This day couldn't get better. But wait! Rainbow Bird incoming! Ooh. The queen is sick and the girls make their way to the fairy kingdom to see her. Shirley and Noah immediately start roasting each other before the queen begins telling them about her reoccurring dream. We learn that the purple girl is a fairy from Songland named Melody. She was the queen's music teacher and best friend. They are so cute! Of course, as we saw at the beginning of the episode, their ending was not happy. On the eve of the festival, Melody went missing, and everyone has forgotten her. Except for the queen. Shirley promises that she and the other fairies will search for Melody. With that, the queen gives them a box to collect melodies that'll restore the power of her harp, so she can call for Melody. And new magical items! Anyway, this season looks so good, and I hope that fan subbers will continue working on this one. Okay, we are back with the final film as of me making this video, which is Balala the Fairy's Princess Camellia. I'm assuming based on her animal powers, her name is kind of a chameleon pun. 
Anyway, the film opens up with this gorgeous scene of the movie's original character, Princess Camellia, using her powers to tame a Neopet. This scene is so cool! Even if Camellia petting the blue creature didn't look as real as it should have. Cutting to Earth, there's a festival and OH MY GOD A MINION! So Camellia's actress was a member of the idol group SNH48, and the film hardcore plays into that, with Maggie and Michelle being fans of the group. As the girls obsess over her, Shirley notices that something isn't quite right and follows her. She transforms and the two chase a bootleg Spyro the Dragon. Yeah. However, the two are not exactly friends yet. The main plot of this movie, other than being an idol commercial, is about Camellia capturing three magical beasts who have gone wild and are roaming around the Earth. Once that's done, Camellia gets closer with the fairies, and they deal with another conflict involving Camellia's kingdom. And yeah, I got bored with this one. I do like some idol groups, but this is not what I'm looking for when I'm watching Balala Bala the, the Fairies. The movie is fine, but it's my least favorite. First movie is best movie. Out of all the seasons, I think Over the Rainbow has the strongest resemblance to an already existing Precure season design-wise. Not a complaint, but the first time I saw this, I was like, oh my gosh, out of all the seasons to potentially rip off? You choose Happiness Charge? The one the fans hate? Okay! First airing on November 13th, 2016, Over the Rainbow tells the story of a kingdom we haven't seen before. This is the Color Castle. An evil man named Dark Lord has awoken from his slumber, and has stolen all the color from the kingdom to power his own. Luckily, Bubbly Pink lead Jesse, Tomboy Haley, and Crybaby Amy have stumbled upon this magic kingdom, and have gained fairy powers. Now it's up to these three human-turned fairies to bring color back to the kingdom and stop the Dark Lord. The first thing you'll notice about this season is that it has a completely new cast of characters. Shirley, Maggie, Michelle, and Emma will no longer be the leads we follow. Instead, the remaining series have brand new casts, like what Precure or Jewel Pet does. I really like this change because we've had plenty of time with those characters, and Balala could use some new settings and characters to work with. From what I'm able to understand, Jessie is a transfer student going to a prestigious-looking academy. Her and her father have totally opposite personalities, which has strained their relationship, and her mother isn't in the picture. At this academy is where Jessie meets Haley and Amy. They're super sweet, but the other girls? Not so much. These three are absolute mean girls, and I already hate them. But the main one gets spit on, so that's funny. Anyway, the redheads trap Jessie in a closet with a roach. But that's where she discovers two fairies that take her to another world. It's from here we get into the magical hijinks, and the girls work to save the color castle. I really like the premise for this one, and the animation looks lovely. Although I'm not sure it's as good as Finding Melody. Especially about halfway through where the animation style changes. It's more bouncy and not in a good way. There's also a fourth fairy who comes in later. She's so cute and she's a princess! Ah, I love this one! Ocean Magic is the season that caught my attention first. One, because it's ocean themed! And two, because it switches from 2D to 3D animation between seasons. Because this one is epic enough to have two seasons! And a live action. Also, it has multiple dubs, including English. I have never heard of Star Times, and I'm not alone on that because no one archived this dub. If you live in Africa and you see this dub, please record it. This is insane. Balala never gets international attention, but I'm so happy it's this season because I love what I've been able to watch. So there's an ocean castle and a magical underwater world, because why not? But there's trouble in the kingdom. So Azor goes to the surface to investigate. It's there that she finds two boys who litter. Surfer girly Finn scolds the boys, but they kick her board and run away. Azur sees this and humbles those brats with magic. I love, I love her already. already. Meanwhile, Kaylin is reading a surfing magazine, but is scolded by her sister. Our blue girly walks in, and we get this adorable scene. Did I mention I love her already? Because I love her already. Kaylin tells Finn about Azur and how she thinks there's something odd about her. 
the tune then spy on her playing the ocarina? Freckled Zelda moment? They continue spying on her as she disappears into the ocean. Magically. I love this ocean kingdom so much. It's so pretty. And is there's ocean charm device? It's not a want, it's a need. So while Azur is appreciating this magic orb, the dark energy has infiltrated the kingdom and is making people, well, do that. Luckily, our blue girly has the power to heal. So when she finds Prince Haida, she does so and he fills her in on who brought this dark energy here in the first place. It was the king. There's also a dark version of him? Possibly? This guy's name is Prince Moda. He'll be important later. When Azur returns home, Kaylin and Finn are waiting for her, with a giant monster behind them. Azur transforms, quickly saves them, and both girls immediately want her to teach them magic. This feels a lot like the original series with a color swap, and I like that. Also, the prince pops out at the very end. Why is he here? Find out in the next episode, but first, educational segment! Oh my gosh, this is giving major Discovery Kids energy. This is literally the cutest thing ever! If magical girls were the ones to educate us, I think as a society we'd be a lot smarter. In the next episode, Azura lectures Prince Haida, foremost likely attracting the sea beast to the shore and putting humans in danger. He begs her to help him increase his magic energy to help keep his kingdom safe. She's resistant at first, but reluctantly agrees. When she gets back to her room, the girls immediately start questioning Azura about her magic again. She messes with them, big sister energy, but eventually caves and we get our other two magical girls of the season. While the save the castle and stop evil plot is important to ocean magic, this series puts a spotlight on how littering negatively impacts the ocean and how we should respect and educate ourselves on the wonderfully unique creatures on land and sea. I really love that aspect of the show, even if it might come across as preachy at times. Out of all the seasons, this is the one I really want to finish. Now we're at the current season that has a million different names. Magic Star Fate Castle and its sequel season Star Fate Butterfly Awakening. The lovely Horado's ghost on Twitter has kept me updated with his posts and reposts of Balala content, including the new fan sub for the latest Balala installment. It's an ongoing project as of me making this video, but I'm so happy to write about what I can. Magic Star Fate Castle began airing on April 21st, 2022, and stars three normal girls. Sha, Yan, and Bai. Sha and Bai give Usagi and Rei energy, while Yan is totally bubbles. I'm glad their personalities are so distinct, because I could not tell these girls apart if they did not have different hairstyles and eyebrow shapes. The girls have natural hair colors in their human forms in this season, and I don't love that choice, but this was done because of the Chinese, Chinese government. government. In 2020, a Korean show called Shining Star was banned due to its influence on young people to want to dye their hair unnatural colors. But Balala and Precure still roam free, huh? Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? There's gotta be more to that story. There are bigger problems in the world than hair color, but I can see how the Balala team could want to play things safe. Anyway, these three stumble upon a magic kingdom in trouble! Wow! So unpredictable! And these three elves give them magic powers so they can collect all the magic stones, defeat a villain named Fezna, very threatening name there, and save the magic star fate castle. Decent premise, and I wish I could say more about this one, but it's currently a challenge to find. It's not on the official Balala the Fairies YouTube channel or anywhere I can access online beyond episode 1. However, Star Fate Butterfly Awakening is a different story. Only airing a few months ago, Season 2 picks up with the girls hanging out at an empty bakery. It's owned by a redeemed Fezna? She looks so pretty! Anyway, she's been getting visions about a strong winter taking over. The girls are like, oh, well, that won't happen. Bye! But then it does happen! And Shaw is the only one to escape. She is taken to the beautiful Garden of Spring. However, an ice monster is causing problems there too. Shaw does take her elf back. Side note, these fairies are ugly as sin. I don't mind the yellow one, but the blue and pink ones? Yikes. Anyway, Shaw transforms in an almost Aikatsu-like fashion. Not complaining, this is such a vibe. And she looks gorgeous in this pink floral outfit. 
She saves her elf and some other local creatures before we cut to the main villain of the season being menacing. And what in the healing good precure is this outro? They're slaying! But the visuals? I see, I see what, what you're, you're trying, trying to do. I'm loving the premise for this one as well, but continuity is a little crazy so far, because in episode 2, Yon and Bai are unfrozen now? I'm assuming Shaw did this off screen, but wouldn't it have been better for them to break out on their own and unlock their powers? Or to at least show Pinkie Pie rescuing her friends? No? Okay. So in this episode, Yon follows this frosty little guy into the island of Fantastical Summer. This is very ocean magic core. She saves this place like Shaw saved the last one. That leaves Bai with the Autumn World. Again, I cannot wait to watch more of this one because it's off to a good start. I hope the team behind the Balala translations gets more recognition because arranging everything just, just so, so a show, a show can, can be accessible, accessible in multiple languages, languages is no easy task. Wait, I've talked about every season. What else is there to discuss? Oh boy! You would be surprised what else the series has done. Fast food collaborations, media crossovers, tech commercials, manga, mech figures, video games, and the toys! Oh, the toys! Let's jump in. First, we've got to talk about the toys. Typically, for my videos, I like to make item segments, but I only have the pink fairy phone. It's a Tamagotchi clone with some magical flair. I like it, but it's not the best item ever. Balala, especially the later seasons, has really cool toys. I appreciate the later seasons more because they're a lot more original than earlier seasons. If you're in the Magical Girl community, you've probably seen this image pop up. While not appearing in any season, Balala had an almost exact copy of the Pre-Chan Mirror from Happiness Charge Precure. It wasn't made by the main Balala toy makers, and it was so obviously a ripoff that Balala's version was taken off shelves almost immediately, so it's pretty hard to find. Of course, magical items are not all there is in the toy department. Dolls, plushies, totally not Polly Pocket sets, and figures all come with the territory of having a children's franchise. Commercials, collaborations, and live shows are common as well. Maggie and Michelle are in an educational tablet commercial. Shirley can be seen advertising Tastian Burger. The Ocean Magic crew can be found at Daiko's in celebration of Children's Day. And Emma can be seen promoting proper dental hygiene. As she should. But as the series has gotten older, so has the audience that grew up with those original seasons. Crossovers with the drama Song of the Moon can be found on the official Balala Weibo account. A handful of video games have featured Balala characters. I love the art of Shirley and Moonlight Blade, oh my gosh! And a few characters were even featured on a variety show. The weirdest thing I found was that one of the character designers for Over the Rainbow featured the girls briefly in his adult erotic manga. Huh? How about we don't feature children in those sorts of stories? That's really gross! Bala the Fairies is a franchise that doesn't get enough praise for what it does right, but that's not the series' fault. It just hasn't had an opportunity to reach other countries, with a few exceptions. Alpha Group Co. clearly has or had intentions to bring Balala the Fairies to other markets, and that finally seems to be happening, but not to the extreme that it could. I truly believe that if the later seasons were put on a platform like Netflix, they would totally take off. Korean Magical Girl series like Flowering Heart and Catch Teeny Pink have found moderate success there. Heck, even Precure, but we don't talk about that attempt. Good riddance, save our friends. At the very least, I hope you can see the appeal of this franchise even if I haven't convinced you to watch it. I hope this series will get more love and recognition online, because there's a lot to like here. Thanks for watching! Two Magical Girl videos in a row took a lot of energy out of me. So the next video will be something girly, but different. Subscribe if you enjoyed this video, and make sure to follow me on TikTok and Instagram. I post lots of cute content. Lastly, troop on hopelets, stay adorkable, bye!